my name is Richard Thornton and I'm the Chief Executive Officer for the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre. I'd like to welcome everybody along to the National Fire Fuels Science Forum webinar um, brought to you today by um, the Australian Academy of Sciences and the Bushfire and Natural Hazards uh, Cooperative Research Centre. I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands on which we meet today. Um, we're meeting across many different areas across Australia and many parts around the world, so it's important to acknowledge the traditional owners. Um, we'd also specifically like to acknowledge the elders, um, past, um, present and future of um, and any Indigenous people that may be with us today. <clears throat> These webinars are a scaled down version of what we intended to hold in the Canberra Forum uh, about a month ago, which unfortunately we had to cancel due to the COVID uh, outbreak. But the um, aims are still the same. We're holding these um, to, to help the various um, inquiries around the country at the moment understand uh, some of the issues and the science that underpins the use of uh, managing landscapes for, for, for fire. <clears throat> the aim is also to bring together some of the leading scientists to determine the state of the science of prescribed burning, what is known, what is unknown, what's in agreement, and where, where do we actually have dispute and need more knowledge. So there's three sets of webinars. We held the first one last week. This is the, the middle one that's examining the, the science. And next week we are looking um, more at the practice. Um, we've invited speakers who represent a range of views and particularly those that have expressed views uh, over the past summer period. Um, to try and debate and discuss the new um, thinking, the new challenges and some of those long perennial um, challenges. So it, it can be a divisive type of subject. We've invited people who some of you will invite, will vehemently agree with and some that, that you vehemently object to their views. That's the point is that we can have this conversation to try and dig into where is the common ground, what is still unknown. Last week, we heard from um, a number of speakers. We heard um, from Sarah Harris who, from the CFA, who talked about some of the meteorological indicators and challenges um, from climate change impacting on prescribed burning. We heard from Sasha Rundle from the ABC Emergency Broadcasting, highlighting many of the diverse opinions that have been seen in the media. <clears throat> we heard from Oliver Costello from the Fire Sticks Alliance talking about the benefits of cultural burning. And we heard from Justin Leonard um, from CSIRO with it, looking at the factors that influence um, building survival and, um, and survival of um, the populations. Um, before we get into this, it's worth just highlighting there's a new book that's um, due to be published uh, very soon from the Centre of Excellence for Prescribed Burning, titled Prescribed Burning in Australasia, the Science, Practice and Politics of Burning the Bush. So keep your eyes peeled for that later in May. Many of these issues were also addressed in, in a current edition of the International Journal of Wild, Wildland Fire, um, a special edition on adapt, adaptive and prescribed burning in Australia for the early 21st century, the context, status and challenges. Um, last week we had almost 450 people who watched in on the, um, the webinar, which is now online. Um, this, this week the interest is even stronger. So I look forward to a, a challenging, hopefully, uh, webinar uh, and strong uh, interaction through the Q&A. I'd now like to hand over to the um, MC for this session, which will be Gary Morgan. Um, over to you, Gary. Thank you, Richard. It's my pleasure to be the MC of today's National Fire Fuel Science webinar, and it is being recorded for later online access. So all attendees will receive an email when the video is available on the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC website. The structure this morning is that we will have five speakers uh, with each speaking for approximately seven minutes and then we'll move to questions. The interest 
in today's webinar is huge. So how are you going to ask a question? Well, all attendees can do so at any time using the question and answer chat on the right hand side of the screen. It is the little icon with the speech bubble uh, with a question mark. Uh, questions will be moderated as we go along and answered in the second half of the session. Going off last week's successful webinar, we expect that there will be many questions, so we don't expect to be able to cover everyone today. So if you have a similar question to one already posed, please like it. The more likes, the greater the chance that your question or the question you like will be uh, put forward and then answered. We'll endeavour to follow up with each speaker for them to answer key questions later on. I don't get time to address them all today. So to introduce the first speaker, it is uh, Dr Neil Burrows. Neil has more than 40 years fire ecology research experience working with Western Australia's conservation land management agencies, where he was an applied bushfire scientist, primarily in forest and desert ecosystems. Neil was recognised for his quality research and appointed as the Director of Science, where he remained for 14 years, for the various Western Australian land management agencies until he retired. He's been a key industry advisor to both the Bushfire CRC and the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC. Neil now runs his own fire research consultancy. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Gary. And thanks for the opportunity to, to give you a Western Australian perspective on prescribed burning. The evidence I present here is supported by the published papers, by, by published papers, many of which I've uh, referred to in my five page summary, which is available from the CRC. So landscape prescribed burning done properly and at the appropriate temporal and spatial scales is the most important part of a comprehensive integrated bushfire management system, certainly in, in Southwest WA. Without it, we know from bitter experience that the inevitable high intensity bushfires will overpower, overwhelm and compromise other com components of the system, including suppression response and community preparedness. Landscape prescribed burning is not designed to prevent bushfires, but to make them less damaging, safer, easier and cheaper to put out. And of course, fires at the interface, uh, sorry, fuels at the interface uh, in backyards also need to be managed. Change slide, please. Evidence supporting the benefits of prescribed burning comes from three sources, fire science, history and experience. Prescribed burning done properly reduces the speed, intensity, flame dimensions and spotting potential of bushfires, which greatly assists our firefighters. It does this by simplifying fuel structures and by reducing fuel load, especially in the important surface and near surface fuel layers. These fuel layers are important to fire behaviour because they are dead fine fuels that can become very dry and if left unburnt, very heavy, making up to 70% of the total fuel load. And importantly, they are at the base of the fuel ladder. Uh, the graph you can see there shows the build up of fuel load and hazard in a Jarrah forest both increased with time, then more or less plateau. In young carry forest fuels, the understory shrubs or elevated fuels are taller and, and a lot denser than those in Jarrah forest. So the hazard rating of this layer is higher than in Jarrah forest. After about 25 to 30 years, the shrubs die off, reducing the hazard rating in the elevated layer. However, and unfortunately, the material, dead material doesn't go to heaven. It accumulates on or above the forest floor adding to the fuel load of the important surface and near surface fuel layers, waiting to be cremated in the next bushfire. Then it stalks the planet as millions of tonnes of carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and other products of hot combustion. In carry forest, high intensity fires, whether planned or unplanned, promote the development of dense live green understory. And the most effective way we found to mitigate this and to reduce the hazard and load of surface and near surface fuels is with regular low intensity fire. In our experience, old forest fuels have the potential to burn with great ferocity and our firefighters would much prefer to be dealing with fire in four year old fuels than in 40 year old fuels. Next slide, please. 
Almost 60 years of data from the southwest forests of WA show that when the area burnt by prescribed fire trends down, then the area then the area burnt by bushfire trends up. And there's a simple reason for this. Fires are easier to control in landscapes with a substantial proportion of younger, lighter fuels. Prescribed burning needs to be done properly. To flatten the curve, it's necessary to burn at least 8% of the forest or bushland in a region each year. Over time, this results in about 40% of the region carrying zero to five year old fuels. The burning needs to be done to a standard. The burns need to be sufficiently large to slow a bushfire and it needs to be strategic. Next slide, please. Our firefighters know the importance of prescribed burning. For those of you without firefighting experience, I don't have time to go through it here, so I refer you to the five page summary available via the CRC. I've heard it said that prescribed burning doesn't work because someone saw a bushfire burn through a three-year-old fuel. I can cite many examples where bushfires were stopped or slowed when they burn into one, two and three-year-old fuels. But this is a simplistic analysis of how a well-planned and well-executed regional prescribed burning program functions to assist firefighters in putting fires out and protecting our communities. Next slide, please. After almost 60 years of prescribed burning in our fire regime adapted forests, there is no evidence of biodiversity loss or decline in ecosystem health that can be attributed to prescribed burning. Prescribed burns in low fuel conditions result in fire with low burn severity and low killing power. They are patchy, resulting in diverse understory serial stages. Fire sensitive species generally occur in less flammable habitats and persist by either surviving or escaping low intensity flames. And the bush recovers relatively quickly. On the other hand, the alternative regime, a cycle of mega fires burning in dry, long unburnt fuel is harmful to the environment and devastating to our wildlife and our communities. They are unnatural disasters. Next slide, please. There are of course impediments to implementing an effective prescribed burning program. These include the will to do so, windows of weather opportunity, air quality issues, risks and challenges with burning old fuels, resources and experiences to do the job, conflicting and confusing science, ideologically driven opposition, and so on. But where there's a will, there's a way. And these impediments can largely be overcome or at least managed by strong leadership at government and agency levels, well-resourced, well-trained, competent people to do the job, problem-solving applied science and innovation, and garnering broad community support through education and information programs. And of course, prescribed burning is not without cost or without risk. The cost of not prescribed burning, not just measured in dollars, but also in blood, sweat and tears, far outweighs the cost of burning. Despite our best efforts, things don't go, always go to plan which can result in higher levels of scorch and defoliation than we would like, and occasionally burns escape. The risk escalates when we are burning in old fuels or mixed fuels. It takes courage to put fire out, but it also takes courage to put fire in. And finally, our prescribed burning program is designed in a risk management framework. It's adaptive to the changing environment in which we operate and to new information as it comes to hand. Thank you, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Neil. Um, certainly for the operational personnel who are watching today, um, they, they would have experienced many impediments to burning and would welcome the insights from you on how to manage them. Our next speaker is Professor Mike Clark from La Trobe University. He is Professor of Zoology and has a long-standing interest in the impacts of fire upon fauna. He conducts research into the impact of fire in the Victorian ecosystems such as the Mallee, the Box Iron Bark Forest, the Central Highlands, and also on Wilson's Promontory. He previously convened the Scientific Advisory Committee on Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act to the Victorian Minister for Environment for five years. Uh, Mike was a member of the 2009 Victorian Bushfires Royal Commission expert panel on prescribed burning. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Gary, really appreciate the introduction. Um, I'll work my way through the four questions we were set. Uh, so if I can have the next slide, I'll get, kick off with what is known. 
And I'm going to stick with what's been published in the scientific peer-reviewed literature and thereby hopefully reduce the risk of injecting ourselves with disinfectant or bleach in our search for a cure at this point in time. And I think Ross Bradstock's uh, framework reminds us of the four triggers that are crucial for big fires, spatially connected plant biomass that is dry enough to burn, an ignition source, and then conditions that promote spread, high temperature, strong winds and low humidity. Uh, as Neil has outlined, fuel reduction burning can be very valuable in reducing the intensity and spread of bushfires and aid suppression when conditions are below extreme or, or severe under moderate conditions. Um, okay, we're back with that, that's good. Um, and establishing control lines when conditions are moderate. However, numerous studies around the world have examined the effect of fire weather on fires that have caused fatalities and weather, prevailing weather conditions in a number of studies from around the world have predominated. If I could have the next slide, please. I'm up to point four here. In regard to where, where fuel reduction burning is most effective, it's recognised that not all hectares burnt are equally valuable in reducing risk. Fuel reduction closest to assets um, is the most effective in reducing risk and studies by Phil Gibbons and Trent Penman have illustrated that. In terms of our hopes of what's going to be achieved, um, fuel reduction's burning capacity to reduce losses on those extreme days when people die, as uh, Justin Leonard reminded us last week, um, the effects uh, are modest at times. And in Victoria, the Forest Fire Management um, Division estimates that the reduction in fuel, sorry, the capacity of fuel reduction burning to reduce residual risk to life and property on those extreme days is modest. They estimate that if they achieve all their target, which in Victoria at the moment is about 240,000 hectares per annum, if they achieve all of those targets, they will reduce the risk by about three to five percent compared to if no re fuel reduction burning was done. And I sus suspect that's a bit more modest than most people might hope for. And finally, last week, Sarah Harris reminded us that the published evidence shows that the, the landscape is changing. We're experiencing more fires more often um, and uh, they were in the periods of longer and widespread droughts more extreme fire weather days, longer fire seasons that are starting earlier, and frustratingly fewer days per year suitable for safe fuel reduction burning. That's the context in which we're working. Next slide, please. I think we'd be in agreement that our primary goal in fire management is reducing risk to the things we cherish. And I've broken them into the three categories here, lives and health of humans, the things we value as assets, uh, whether it's crops, timber, water, carbon, infrastructure and ecosystems. And uh, I don't think there's any dispute as Neil's outlined to us, if we go to the next slide please, that um, low severity fires do a lot less ecological damage than high severity fires. And I've tried to reflect that here in the size of my big red arrow and a smaller red arrow coming from a cooler burn. However, our research and that of many ecologists illustrate that some vegetation types might require fire, others don't. And fire, our own research um, has illustrated that fires can be too hot, too frequent and extensive for a number of ecosystems. Different ecosystems require different fire regimes and that's one of our challenges. Consequently, one fire regime doesn't fit all. And the other thing I think we regrettably have to agree on, and next slide please, is the change in context. Drought conditions in this past savage summer have shown us that previously non-combustible plant biomass has become combustible. And firefighters are reporting places of burning that we haven't seen burning in the past. Rainforest gullies, damp, damp mountain uh, tops on landscape scales. And this is really challenging territory as we see an increase in the extent, frequency and severity of droughts. So what's disputed? If I could go to the next slide, there is still a lot of debate across the broad range of ecosystems that we're trying to manage fire in about the efficacy of fuel reduction burning. And as Neil's 
outlined to us, it's easy to get trapped into my anecdote is better than your anecdote as we look at where a fire has or has not been pulled up by fuel reduction burning. And we need to work out good ways to measure the impact of fuel reduction burning in limiting the extent and severity of wildfires. And the challenge there is doing that kind of calculation while also controlling for climatic conditions, weather on the day, topography of the landscape, vegetation type, how effective was the fuel reduction that had been done? Did it actually re remove the fuels that we hoped it would? How did, what role did uh, aerial or ground suppression activity play in containing or reducing the spread? So to actually pull out and identify this was the contribution fuel reduction burning made is a really challenging piece of science and it's contentious. If I could have the next slide, please. The other is uh, the, how biomass changes with time since fire. Neil's shown us some really helpful graphs there of the kind of data you need to understand how fuels change over time. And some of our forests are very old and we a 60 year time span is terrific to have, but some of our forests get much older than that and we need to understand fuels and how they change and if I could have the next slide, please. How the quantity of combustible biomass changes with time since fire, particularly in a time of climate change. What is happening to the distribution of that biomass which is available to burn? And that's been the focus of a number of ongoing debates in the literature at the moment as I read it, where people are trying to work out the relative contribution of fuel loads and drought and weather in explaining large fires. If I come to the final point of where we um, need to go next, what I see is the big knowledge gaps. If I could have the next slide, please. I think there are four in my mind at least. Starting with number one in the green box at the bottom, an ecological challenge. How will a drying climate affect the capacity of ecosystems to recover from fires? They are likely to be going into fire more ecologically stressed than in the past and they're likely to come out and face tougher conditions after the fire. And that's in a context where fires are going to be more frequent, more severe and more extensive. So what does that mean for our current estimates of minimal to tolerable fire intervals for different plant and animal communities? What's the gap between fires that's tolerable and which our ecosystems can tolerate? The second question I've touched on a little bit before, and that's how the biomass, the connectivity and the flammability of our fine fuels at or near the ground surface is going to change under climate change. And in that context, how effective will our fuel reduction burning be? Is it going to be continue to be as effective um, or is that going to be changing? And then finally, the, the area I think we need to get smarter at and more rigorous in is how does the return for effort and investments in fuel reduction burning stack up against other complementary actions we might take? Is this the best investment of public funds amongst a, mon a number of different things we might invest in? Public and private fire shelters, improved communication, evacuation planning and execution, planning and building codes, uh, rapid detection of fires and rapid suppression techniques. We need to understand the relative contribution and the merit of all those activities. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Richard advised you all that uh, there'd be some controversial views and certainly we've already got off to a start with the first two speakers. Um, certainly they're agreeing that low intensity fires gives less damage than high intensity fires. But what is disputed at this stage is where to burn for ecological benefits and public safety, let alone firefighter safety. So we'll continue on and we'll get some more views as they go through. So the next speaker I'm pleased to announce is Associate Professor Tina Bell from the University of Sydney and the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC. She has a long association with the CRC uh, doing fire research for the Bushfire CRC as a lead researcher. And today she leads the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC research on fire and its effects on water and carbon management. In 2018, Tina was recognised by the journal Fire as a leading female in fire science internationally. Welcome. I'm very pleased to hear that, Tina. And uh, 
in also in 2009, she received the Fulbright Scholarship to study psychological processes of grapevines exposed to smoke. So welcome, Christina. Thanks, Gary, and good morning, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to present at this forum. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to examine the use of prescribed burning for objectives other than reduction of risk, and as Mike just mentioned, for biodiversity. Um, but that's not to say prescribed burning shouldn't be done, but how can we do prescribed burning for other um, features? And Mike beautifully introduced it. So I'm going to do this around the basis of two assets that he had up on one of his slides, carbon and water. Next slide, please. So we start off with the water cycle. Uh, in forests, there's uh, inputs of rainfall that's intercepted by the vegetation. Some of that gets used by the vegetation uh, for growth and um, development. Other gets run off to catchments and that is makes water a very valuable catchment, a very valuable asset in water catchments around Australia. This gives the quality and quantity of water that we expect in Australia um, for cities and for industrial and agricultural purposes. But the forests also need water. They take it up from the soil um, and transpire it for processes of photosynthesis, production of living biomass, uh, increases in the fuel layer that uh, we want to reduce with prescribed burning. Next slide, please. There we go. Uh, alongside that, we've got carbon cycling um, with the red arrows here. Carbon dioxide is the main feature here. It's taken up by living biomass uh, uh, through the process of photosynthesis. Plants grow, produce fuel. That fuel, fall, uh, the litter falls to the ground. It's decomposed by soil microorganisms and other uh, invertebrates living in the soil. They respire, uh, give off carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. So a cycle is forming. Next slide, please. There you go. And on top of that, we have fire, whether it's planned fires in prescribed burning or unplanned fires um, with wildfires and bushfires that we that we see on an uh, unfortunately much more regular basis than we've been used to. So forest cycling, um, water and carbon, of course, this also includes nutrient cycling, but I won't touch on that today. So the water is an asset. We've got to have clean drinking water in plenty of quantities. Carbon um, as a store in the forest, in the litter on the ground, these are assets that are not usually um, researched, and I'll show you evidence of that shortly, but are very important. Uh, next slide, please. So we've done some work on um, the effects of prescribed burning on water, uh, field sites in New South Wales, Victoria and ACT getting empirical evidence from the fire. And this is what we found with using that um, field-based evidence plus some modeling exercises. Uh, what happens to the water cycle after a single prescribed burn? And I make that a single prescribed burn. We go out, look at forests before and after a prescribed burn or in areas that have been burnt and unburnt. Um, I'll get to the, the problems associated with not looking at multiple burns a little bit later. So what we found is that a single prescribed burn has a minimal effect on total evapotranspiration. And that is uh, removal of water from the system back to the atmosphere, atmosphere by microorganisms, plants, animals, uh, evaporation from the surfaces. It's the biggest component of the water balance. So if you can understand how that changes with a prescribed burn, you've got a pretty good handle on the water cycle. Minimal effects happen with prescribed burning, mainly because the overstory trees remain intact and they are the biggest part of the water cycle for um, this point here. But prescribed burning does have uh, some effect and we've modelled and have found that there's great availability of soil moisture after a prescribed burn. Um, this moisture, it's thought, um, many of the models um, use that excess water in the soil for growth of the overstory trees. More water available, trees can grow, which sounds great, but there's a caveat on that. That depends on the tree age. And Michael mentioned that we have some very old forests. These forests don't grow nearly as quickly as younger, um, more um, 
regenerative uh, forests, so they may use less of that soil moisture. So it depends very much on the tree age. It also depends on the rate of regrowth of the understory vegetation. And again, as Michael mentioned, if uh, we're coming out of a drought, those uh, vegetation might be stressed beforehand and may not be using that soil moisture. It's great potentially for increasing catchments, but if it means the change in the health of the forest, then we don't know what um, prescribed burning does um, for changing moisture availability. Some of that excess soil moisture go to deep drainage. Again, an area we don't know a lot about. It very, depends very much on soil properties. What we did find uh, from our studies is that there's incredible variability across the landscape in the water components that we could measure of the water cycle. Next slide, please. Okay, using that same empirical, empirical data from the field, we looked at what was the effect on carbon cycling after these prescribed burns. Uh, nice to say, we found a minimal effect of, of um, uh, prescribed burning on the carbon pools in the overstory trees. Um, overstory trees mainly, again, because they remain intact. A prescribed burning that uh, uh, takes out the um, uh, surface and lower fuel layers um, shouldn't take out the overstory trees. So that carbon pool that's represented by the overstory trees remains intact. We found uh, variability 25 to 350 tonnes per hectare, uh, tonnes of carbon per hectare in the forest that we studied. So that represents a pretty big pool. Similarly, underground, um, an area that's rarely studied is the soil carbon. And if it is studied, it's uh, only measured in the top 10, 20, 30 centimetres. In that top 30 centimetres, we found um, carbon pools there, 125 to 270 tonnes of carbon per hectare. They mainly stay intact uh, under prescribed burning and a single prescribed burn, I stress that again. So there are carbon pools that are uh, affected by prescribed burning and some modelling that we did um, suggested that release of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere during the combustion processes could be anywhere between 20 to 139 tonnes of carbon per hectare. Depends on the model you use and the assumptions you make. Check that number against the pools that are still remaining, supposedly remaining intact in the overstory trees and in the soil. It does represent a good proportion depending on uh, what models are being used. Most of the carbon is lost from the little layer. That's not surprising because this is the layer that um, prescribed burning aims to reduce. Anywhere between three to 10 tonnes of carbon per hectare from the studies we did. Coarse woody debris, uh, uh, carbon's lost to the atmosphere as CO2. Um, anywhere between one and 35 tonnes of carbon per hectare. That's a huge variability. And this is from 100 sites from across uh, uh, Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT. We kept finding great variability in the loss of carbon from coarse woody debris during a single prescribed burn. There's smaller losses from understory vegetation anywhere between one and seven tonnes of carbon. Um, from st the sites we looked at in Victoria uh, calculated that from the biomass that was burned, whether it was live biomass or uh, dead biomass, um, between three and five percent of the, the bi above ground biomass was converted to charcoal and ash. So that doesn't go to the atmosphere, but that goes into potentially into the soil carbon. Um, our studies were single fire, but they also didn't have um, a lot of follow up. Um, it takes a lot of effort to do 100 uh, fuel reduction fires and the sampling after them. So we, uh, one set of studies, we only looked at what the carbon accumulation was one year after fire and found that the greatest gains of carbon came from reaccumulation of litter. We have very little understanding of the regrowth of the understory vegetation and how much carbon gain that is, that um, represents how much is representing by growth of overstory trees. Um, surprisingly or not, we found great variability across the landscape and we don't really have a handle on how variable it is across the landscape. We did our studies in dry sclerophyll forests. It's a, a fairly common forest type, but we have found incredible var um, variability across the landscape. Okay, that's what we've been doing, but I wanted to look a little bit further afield. So next slide, please. Did a uh, uh, investigation of the recent peer-reviewed 
literature um, about prescribed burning in Australia. And I apologise for all the international listers, uh, listeners. I restricted this to Australia uh, in the last 10 years. So looking at those studies, prescribed burning, there's a whole swathe of information from um, bushfires as well, but this is just prescribed burning. 53% of them uh, had some sort of field component, collecting empirical uh, evidence from the field, and uh, about 40% uh, had some sort of synthesis. So it was modeling based, it was review based, or some sort of gathering together of information to inform management. Uh, the numbers don't quite add up, so there was a couple of studies that we weren't quite sure where they fitted. For the fire regime, so um, I've admitted we only looked at a single prescribed burn. 35% uh, 35 35 of other studies looking at prescribed burning in Australia over the last 10 years uh, also look at single fires. That is, what happens with one prescribed burn? I'm happy to say that we found that a lot of studies are looking at multiple fires, and this was classified as time since fire, which was mentioned by um, Michael as being uh, one of his key important features, um, or, but also uh, fires of different frequency, um, what happens uh, with prescribed burning over time with different frequency. So we are getting literature and research and information that's looking at not just a single fire, which has its um, usefulness, but multiple fires. What's the ongoing uh, additional, maybe um, progressive effects of multiple prescribed burns. Looking at the focus of the different studies, um, sad to say that only 6% of the studies investigated the effect of prescribed burning on water. Our water that we take for granted coming out of our taps and sprinklers. Um, carbon, uh, looking at uh, 9% of the studies uh, investigated the carbon cycling aspects. 17% um, of studies of prescribed burning looked at the effect on soils. Uh, just take your eye over to the 7% there. We've got 7% of the studies started looking at combined multiple objectives. What's the effect of prescribed burning on carbon and soil? Flora and fauna, as um, more or less expected, many of the prescribed burning studies are looking at the effects of prescribed burning on some aspect of the flora or the fauna. Um, and the last two uh, parentheses there, multiple objectives. Uh, very few studies look at the multiple objectives of prescribed burning for water and carbon, or the, and uh, that represents uh, one or two studies, and the same for the combination of the effects of prescribed burning on soil and flora. So we are getting onto the right direction for our research, looking at the effects of multiple prescribed burns on the environment, but looking at um, some of the features within the um, prescribed burning effects. Uh, some are still remain well studied, but others such as water and carbon, these valuable assets that we have that our forests provide, that are not being researched just yet. Okay, I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, that was a good explanation about the forest cycles, particularly on carbon and water, and you provide some good gaps on a full understanding of where and where we should go to, particularly with multiple uh, prescribed burning. Our next presenter is adjunct professor, associate professor, sorry, uh, Philip Silstra. Um, he models and the connections between ecosystems and fire. He's at the University of Curtin. He was previously a research fellow for fire and fauna modelling at the University of Wollongong before he joined Curtin University about seven months ago. He is an alumni for the Bushfire CRC student program, having completed in 2011 his PhD at the University of New South Wales on bushfire behaviour modelling. Welcome, Philip. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, next slide, please. I've I've taken the title for my talk from this article published in the Conversation in January, um, and I think the line "Take out the stuff that burns" encapsulates a lot of our thinking about fire behaviour and how we manage fuels in Australia. Um, I'd like to add some nuance to that idea. It's attractive because if we look at this campfire, if we had no sticks there, we would have no fire and it seems obvious. And indeed, next slide please. Uh, 
uh, we can see that Australian fire management has been based on this idea for over half a century. That comes from this graph that Alan MacArthur produced in 1967, showing that if we double the fuel load, he claimed we would double the rate of spread. Next slide, please. Um, Alan MacArthur, however, saw this as more of a back of the envelope calculation around fire and assumed that there would be further more intensive research that would follow on from this. Now, the reason for this is that we don't make life and death decisions in general based off nine data points in leaflets that haven't been peer reviewed. We wouldn't see that happen in a field like medicine. Um, Peer review has fallen out of favour in some circles in the current political climate, but it's a central tenet of uh, the scientific method. There has been um, peer reviewed work that has looked at this question since then. And next slide, please. Um, central to that is this work that was conducted by Dr. Neil Burrows, who we heard from earlier on in the 90s, who showed that he could find no relationship between the fuel load and the rate of spread. Now, importantly, there's been no peer reviewed work since then that can punch a hole in his work. It's a very sound study. There's also been no peer reviewed work since then that has also that has shown that direct relationship between fuel load and rate of spread. So if it's not fuel load, what is it? Well, this is a picture of a campfire. Next slide. Next slide, please. This is a bushfire. Now, as an experienced firefighter, um, I am doubtful that flames of this size come from just the burning leaf mulch on the ground. My experience is that when it's only the leaf litter burning, it's easy to control that fire with just a rake hoe. Um, the fire becomes a problem fire when the plants ignite. Now, if you were to stand in this forest, if, if you were to stand in the, in the paddock next to this forest on a windy day, you'd quite likely have your hat blown off. But if you stood under the trees, it would stay on because the trees protect you from the wind. The same is true for a fire that burns through this area on, uh, on a milder day when it's not igniting the trees. If the trees aren't on fire, then they're slowing the wind speed beneath them and slowing the fire down. Now, if we put that together, we get the situation where if a plant ignites, it becomes fuel and makes the fire larger. If it doesn't ignite, it slows the wind and slows the fire down. So we can see that the fuel load for that site depends on what the conditions are on whether those plants will ignite. On one day, it could be just the leaf litter on the ground, but on another day, it could be the entire tree canopy. This is why talking about a single number of fuel load for a site like this can be a little bit meaningless in real life. Next slide, please. Now, when I was working in fire management, I tried to put these ideas together and produced the first and still the only peer reviewed fire behaviour model for most of the forests across Australia. And when we validated this model against a range of different fires, next slide, please. What we found was that if we predicted fire using only the surface fuel load, we consistently under predicted the flames. Reason for that is that you just can't get large flames from a layer of leaves on the ground. The only way to get large flames is if large things are burning. So we need the plants to ignite to get those large flames. Next slide, please. When we were able to predict whether they would ignite from the uh, flammability traits of those plants and the structure of the forest, the moisture of the plants, for example, um, we were able to explain about 80% of what was happening across that wide range of forests and fire behavior. So what does this have to do with prescribed burning? Next slide, please. We often hear that the Australian bush loves fire. It's a, it's a popular thing to say. If we look at this alpine ash forest, the left hand side of the road was burnt 12 years previously by a low intensity prescribed burn. Uh, the right hand side has gone longer without fire. As you can see, the regeneration of shrubs and understory is very dense, even though that fire was very low intensity. Next slide, please. 
We see the same thing happening in um, carry forests in WA, where directly after fire, there's dense regeneration, but that self thins over time. This is a trend that we can see across uh, forests around Australia, where uh, fire or other disturbances tend to promote the regeneration of plants close to the ground. Those plants grow taller and self thin as the forest ages. Now, if what determines the actual fuel load uh, on any given day is, is the question of whether those plants will ignite or not, we can expect that dense plants growing close to the ground provide a lot of opportunity for plants to ignite. As a firefighter, I would far prefer to be fighting fire on the right hand side of that road than on the left where those fuels have been burnt 12 years previously. But it's not just a theoretical issue. Next slide, please. When I looked at what has actually happened across a, a very wide range of forests over a one and a half million hectare study area and 58 year um, history of mapped fires, I found um, the same expected trend happening across these forests. Now, as you can see, the intensity of the trend and the timing of it varies between forests quite, quite widely, but the pattern is the same in every one of them. The regrowth is the most flammable stage of that forest that then declines as the forest turns into an older growth stage. Now, just to make this clear, this is not theoretical modeling. This is what has happened over the previous 58 years. As Niels mentioned uh, earlier on, it's there's always somebody who can point to an example that they've seen where a fire has or hasn't stopped in a prescribed burn. So I looked at every, every individual hectare of every fire that has burned and it amounted to approximately 36 million um, case studies effectively for these forests. Now, if we compare that to our traditional expectation, which is the blue line in the background, we can see that our assumption that it's all about fuel loads increasing has completely misunderstood what has happened in the past. I'll also point out that generally when people talk about old growth fuels or fighting fires in, in long unburnt areas, they tend to be talking about areas in that regrowth phase rather than in the actual old growth. One thing that the blue line has in common with the measured lines is that very recently burnt areas are less flammable. And we do see this, we see fires regularly stop in recently burnt areas in the last few years. And so Australian fire management has focused on trying to keep forests to the left hand side of that graph. Problem is we can't practically do this. There just aren't enough safe days to burn. And also we would, we would wipe out a lot of species. We, we know this from numerous studies. We also know that the smoke effects from burning um, have huge effects on, sorry, looks like my video has, has cut out. Um, we know that smoke effects have- You're still on the screen. Oh, okay. We know that smoke effects have huge effects on human health and mortality, whether they are from wildfires or prescribed fires. So because we can't burn as often as we would need to, to keep things to the left hand side of the hump, we end up with a situation such as we had last fire season. Next slide, please. Where across the national parks in New South Wales, the vast majority of forests were within that range of regrowth forests there. We had very little old growth and not enough very recently burnt areas uh, to help control fire. So what do we do with this? Um, I'm hoping perhaps we may be able to discuss that a little bit more, but I personally see some hope if we look at this from a scientific approach where we can see that the evidence very clearly shows a decline in flammability in these old forests. I suspect that there are tools that we can use there um, that will help us to deal with our future fire environment. Thanks very much. Thank you, Phil. Uh, well, we're certainly getting different views coming forward. Uh, there's certainly still agreement uh, for the need for decreased forest fuels, 
what Phil's put forward was a different view on how to manage for the uh, reduced fuel loads. Our next speaker is Professor Mark Adams. Um, Mark has been studying fire since his PhD study sites were, sites were burnt during the Ash Wednesday 1983 bushfires. He has held professorial appointments in three states and five universities. He currently is the Professor of Bioscience and Innovation at Swinburne University of Technology in Victoria. Mark was a program leader, then a board director for the Bushfire CRC. He co-authored the Bushfire CRC book, Burning Issues, covering maintaining biodiversity for soils development and in the carbon, water and nutrient cycles. He is also a member of the 2009 Victorian Bushfires Royal Commission Expert Panel on Prescribed Burning. Welcome, Mark. Mark, can you unmute? I think we're right. Uh, Good on you, Mark. Thanks, thanks very much, Gary, and thank you to all the previous speakers. Um, I have taken the liberty of making some assumptions as to what was going to be covered already and so I uh, am taking all of what has been said as assumed knowledge now and trying to give a slightly different view um, as to where do we stand now in relation as I say in the title of my talk to litter and fuel. Before I go further though I would like to emphasize that at no point um, am I not relying on peer-reviewed science and I'm certainly not relying on one or two points in any one particular graph. So can I have the next slide please? The, the background um, for fuels um, as they're known in the fire science community has been studied uh, was the result of studies that have been done over decades. It's not just a matter of uh, one person's view about relationships between fuel and fire intensity and spread. Uh, those uh, relationships are based on not one, not ten, but literally dozens and dozens of studies. Um, I could point to the very well-known CSIRO work that was led by Phil Cheney, and subsequently by Jim Gould. You can point to the work done by Byram overseas. You can find the support for the relationships between the mass of fuel and fire intensity and spread in literally dozens and dozens and dozens of publications. The, um, the, there are though difficulties and one of my purposes today is to provoke my fellow scientists into thinking a little more about uh, fuel and how well we know it. The first thing to emphasize is that when we talk about above ground fuel, particularly the ground fuels, we're talking about the result of litter fall on the one hand and litter decomposition on the other. And we can immediately note that a large log might persist on the forest floor for decades, in some cases even centuries. Leaf litter on the other hand decomposes quickly. But in between those extremes we've got a huge range of rates of decomposition. The difficulty that I see after having followed the literature now for 30 years is that the forest science community are very much concerned with the standing litter, as I call it, or the fuel, but not so concerned about litter fall or litter decomposition. And it's something that I think has led to myths, miscalculations and misunderstandings. Can I have the next slide, please? The first myth is that fuel loads only accumulate for a few years since the last fire. It's, it's, it's a straight out myth. The miscalculation is one that comes from assuming that fuel loads where litter fall equals litter decomposition 
reach equilibrium within a few years or even 10 years since fire. And then we make predictions about what the fuel load might be on that basis. One of the misunderstandings is that because the fire science community defines fuels uh, in a practical, from a practical uh, common sense point that a one hour fuel is the fine fuel is the leaves and twigs. And this is, as has been shown, well related to things like fire spread. The problem that comes from that is that people then ignore the larger woody fuels. And so what we end up with is literature. And again, I'm going to keep hammering away at the point that I'm basing all of what I say on data and literature, not single papers, but multiple papers. Um, the literature becomes biased to studies of fine fuel and the heavier fuels become less and less uh, uh, known and certainly less well measured and their our understanding of how they behave becomes uh, very poor. The next slide. For the next three or four slides, I'm presenting data from a database that Dr. Matthias Neumann has uh, put together over the last couple of years. Before Matthias's work, we didn't have a national database of litter fall or standing litter. We had some uh, regional analyses, but there was nothing uh, in the published literature that was a truly national uh, database. As you can see in the top panel, the sources of the data are, are spread pretty much around the perimeter of Australia. We have very little data from uh, the interior. If you, in the bottom panel, just to make it clearer, uh, we've simply characterized or classified the areas of Australia according to their climate. And we've used a published climatic uh, zoning for that purpose. I draw your attention particularly to the large areas that are warm but have a seasonal climate, uh, which includes much of southwestern Australia, much of South Australia, inland New South Wales and parts of Queensland. Equally, there are seasonally or strong seasonal climates in northern Australia, uh, obviously in the Northern Territory, parts of Western Australia and Queensland. And then we have the cool wet climates, which are most of Victoria, excluding the Mallee. In, in the, um, I know there are people who are very interested in the Mallee, but the uh, cool wet climates occupy most of Victoria and, large, and a large part of New South Wales. The next slide, please. To give you some idea of the size of this database and the strength of it, you can see from the columns in the table with the N or the number of, uh, of uh, observations that we have many thousands um, of observations for uh, standing litter or the uh, litter layer. We have uh, around about a thousand for litter fall. But perhaps the most important observation that comes out of this national analysis is that for standing litter, the litter on the ground, the variance for any climatic zone is almost as large, in some cases is larger than the mean. That says that we have actually a rather poor ability to predict the ground fuels. If you contrast that with litter fall, the major input, the mean for most climatic regions is much greater than its standard deviation. The next slide, please. The importance of understanding litter input as is that it determines in large part what is the composition of the ground fuels. On the left hand side, we have litter fall as the first column and the standing litter as the second column. In the proportion 
of litter fall, leaves make up 60%. In the standing litter, they only make up 30%. The composition of the standing litter uh, in terms of wood is over 50%, whereas woody fuel that's deposited on the forest floor each year is less than 30%. This just reflects their rate of decomposition. Interestingly, there are clear differences in Australia between, for example, the wet climate areas that dominate in southern New South Wales, Victoria, and the strongly seasonal climates, which include the Mediterranean climate areas of Western Australia, South Australia, the Mallee in Victoria, and the strongly seasonal climates in far northern Australia. Those ecosystems that are accustomed to strongly seasonal climates shown in panel C, have a closer relationship between their composition in terms of leaves and wood than do the wet climate areas shown in panel B. In panel B, you see that the effects of different rates of decomposition are much more profound. In, and it's simply concluded that in the wet climate areas, the litter layer, the ground fuel layer over time is increasingly dominated by woody fuels, much more so than you find in the ecosystems that, have, uh, that are adapted to strongly seasonal climates. The next slide, please. Another, I think, um, telling piece of evidence that comes from this very large database is uh, the ability to analyze what are the contributions of fuel load when we start talking about uh, the intensity and rates of spread of fires such as we've had in the last summer. The data in this slide are all the data that we could find in the literature, the published literature, data that has been peer reviewed. And you can see fairly clearly that there's no great evidence that fuel loads have reached equilibrium within 40 years. Um, as Neil said, uh, they do show the signs of reaching a plateau, but they certainly don't reach a plateau within a few years of the previous fire. And only when the previous fire was less than five years ago, uh, fire intensity is likely to be um, at a level that they can be tackled using hand tools. For most of the area that was uh, affected in 2019-20, um, the suppression techniques far exceeded those that are uh, you can use using hand tools and in some cases well a great deal number of cases were approaching the limit of suppression by any means the next slide please so this is a, a summary i apologize for all the text but um, it's quickly evident that there are some issues around fuel in terms of its characterization and its understanding. We really must acquire much more data about what are the fuels look like in the long unburnt forests, and we need to use those to calibrate fuel, uh, predictive fuel models. The notion that we can ignore heavier fuels, everything, all, woody fuels, for example, greater than one centimetre or greater than 2.5 centimetres, whatever you use is your definition. The idea that you can ignore them is uh, dangerous. The problems from the fire science community is that too often we've got hung up with definitions such as the one hour fuels. Uh, we need, as we go forward, to pay a hell of a lot more attention to things like litter fall and litter decomposition. As Mike Clark said, one of the issues here is what's going to happen as climates get drier. And here, I think we can make a first pass and suggest, well, litter fall 
um, is certainly likely to increase. In many cases, litter decomposition, on the other hand, may decrease if climates get drier. This is likely only uh, to serve to increase fuel loads. And I do think we've got to get rid of simplistic slogans. Uh, it's a curse on all forms of science. And the idea that we have uh, complete understanding, for example, about fuels is simply dangerous. And when you look at the data, when you actually look at the peer reviewed published data, it shows that our knowledge of fuel loads is so imperfect uh, that we need to do uh, literally dozens more studies before we can even reduce the variance to an acceptable level. And I'll leave it there. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, you've got a wealth of research knowledge across the Australian environment. And may I thank you for, for provoking consideration of what actually constitutes fuel. Uh, you did encourage us to consider the varying rates of decomposition decomp and the inclusion of heavy fuels when managing Australia's forests. So thank you to you, Mark, and thank you to all our presenters for their insightful presentations. Richard advised you that the aim was to provide a range of different views on the management of our forest fuels. Well, it certainly appears that aim was met today. So may I now hand to Dr John Bates, the Research Director, at the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC, who will ask questions and direct them at the appropriate presenter. Thank you, John. Thanks, Gary. Um, and just for, for people in, in the audience, we, we have asked, and I have asked the presenters to try and keep their responses relatively short so we can get in as many questions uh, and answers as we can. I, I'm going to just ask a couple of questions to, to the panel as a group, just to see whether there's some, some level of agreement to start from. And, and starting, I guess, with my first question is, does the evidence tell us that fire in the landscape, by whatever means, will reduce the bushfire risk for a period following that fire in, a, in any defined region? And, and I guess I'm looking to the panelists to say, does anyone disagree with that statement? I'll, I'll take silence as saying, yes, we do agree on that, which is certainly something we were trying to, to achieve out of, out of this webinar. My, my second question, really just to see whether there's some agreement as well, is that the evidence tells us that fuel reduction using hazard reduction burns will reduce the rate of spread of a fire, but it will not prevent a fire from starting. Um, and it will not be as effective when the fire, fire conditions are below, above severe, severe or above. Is there a general agreement with that? No, I, I don't agree with that. Um, fuel reduction burning, uh, if you if you take it at the landscape scale, the regional scale, um, is helpful in any five year in any fire danger rating situation. Um, because if if you've got, as I said in my presentation, if you if you manage as we try to maintain the southwest, if you've got around about forty to fifty percent of your landscape carrying fuels in that zero to five year age class, at some point in the fire's uh, spatial travel and at some point temporally, some uh, during the fire bushfire cycle, it's going to encounter these light fuels, which gives firefighters an opportunity to, to get the thing under control and get the upper hand. So I think it's too simplistic to say that um, bushfires are unstoppable virtually in any fuel type or any fuel age once the fire danger rating gets been above extreme or whatever else. That's a really, uh, Mark warned us about using simplistic catch cries, and that's too simplistic. That, that reflects a, a lack of understanding of the, the design, spatial and temporal design of prescribed burning and the spatial and, and the way we go about putting out bushfires. Okay, anyone else on the panel want to comment on that? Yeah, I suppose a perspective I've got from um, when I was working in fire management, I remember in 2002 conducting numerous prescribed burns um, across the area where I was working and then uh, about seven months later having um, the 2003 fires come through that area and one of the issues for us was that um, even though in some cases we had uh, a, a very extensive areas burnt uh, within the previous year, 
um, there were basically nobody was prepared to sit their fire trucks up on that fire trail and wait for the fire to theoretically burn up through that slope to them where they could hose it out. Um, because nobody quite had that confidence that the burns would do that. And consistently those burns were all burnt through in that season and, and could provide us no, no practical advantage in that season. In many cases, they were actually disadvantageous because we would then, in the absence of being able to directly attack that fire, uh, we had to fall back to back burning, which of course is harder to do down a slope through an area that you've just burnt the previous autumn. So I think it's again too simplistic, but probably from the other direction. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, there are times when it is useful, but when we get to very large fire events like 2003 or like this last fire season, we see that very often um, even having extensive areas burnt very recently um, often won't provide us practical help because um, the practicalities of getting firefighters in there and making use of them um, or even having confidence that they will be safe enough to fight fires, in, it, it just undermines the process. Right. Thank you. So moving on, uh, looking at some of the questions that have come through, we, we've got a question that, that really looks at um, something that follows on from some of the talks that Justin Leonard last week where he suggested that it's the last 500 metres before an asset, a house, a settlement that is actually where we can get the greatest gain. And we've got a question that looks at whether smaller burns on the interface are of higher, higher importance than landscape burn and what it would mean if we were to put all of our effort into that and to limit the amount of burning we do in the landscape. And, and I guess there's a follow on question I'll ask beyond that. So I might go, Neil, to you, if you wouldn't mind addressing that question for me. Yeah, sure. Look, no, it is important to reduce fuels at, at all spatial scales in the landscape, in, in, in the bushfire prone areas, including at the interface. That, you know, there's no question about that, uh, including around people's homes. Uh, and a, a lot of time is spent by local governments and others ensuring that that happens prior to the bushfire season. But it is also important to, to deal with the fuel in the broader landscape uh, because the the capacity of fuel reduction around you know whether it's 100 meters or 500 meters around settlements and, and good luck trying to achieve that in the thousands of kilometers of interface that exist in this in in australia or southern australia uh, you're not just going you're not going to be able to do it particularly maintain those fuels at low levels consistently um, but it's got to be done as an integrated program which includes broad scale landscape burning um, and broad, broad scale land, or landscape burning is important because that's generally where the fires start. Uh, they end up at the urban interface, but they generally generally start out, out in, the, in, in further in the bush. Uh, secondly, firefighters are sent out there to put them out. They don't sort of all line up at that interface buffer waiting for the fire to come. Um, sometimes they do when the fire's completely out of control and they've got no choice, they'll fall back to a defensive strategy. But if they can get out, away from the interface, they will attack the fire and try and put it out there. And if you're dealing with low fuels, I just want to make a point on the fuel issue. It's not all about fuel load. That obviously affects fire intensity, but it's fuel structure, which primarily affects rate of spread. Um, the other thing about landscape scale burning is that uh, we've got a lot of values out there. People seem to think that uh, our values in, in, in our country are just around urban settlements. No, they're not out in the, in the broader landscape in the regional areas, we've got values. We've got conservation values, we've got water values, we've got infrastructure values, we've got agricultural farming values, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, that we as a, a fire management agency feel an obligation to protect as well. Certainly they're second order values to life and property. So um, the, the, I, I liken the 500 metre buffer around towns to the old medieval fortress strategy with just putting a moat around your castle. Um, it needs to be done, but you also need to do the other things. We've got to do all those fuel management things, not just one. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. And there are questions too that have come uh, looking at what, with, with the fires, is, is people using the words mega fires. If you look at the fires that, that started over the last summer, where they did start in those areas that, that you talked about. Mike and then Phil, I'm wondering if you might like to comment on, you know, the role of, of using prescribed fire to manage fuel loads to try and, and limit the, the growth and development of mega fires. Uh, yep. Yeah, sorry, I think you're, you're asking me, John, I, I, yep. I missed that. That's, uh, 
the the mega fire phenomenon um, has been around actually for, for quite a while, and I, and I think I just want to preface my comments by saying that uh, suggestions that we've only just heard of mega fires is is really uh, not quite right. The the as Neil has said, and I just have to agree with his uh, all of his comments. Um, unless we deal with the landscape wide uh, issue of fuels, you just open the door for more and more large scale fires. Now that the, the problem and I, all I'm going to do is really um, add to what Neil has said is that once a fire is running, uh, putting it out uh, is a really hard piece of work. As Neil said, you need to be brave if you're going to stand in the face of one of those high intensity fires that Phil Zilstra uh, so nicely illustrated. Um, we can't afford, and again, I emphasize the, value, the idea of values across the landscape. We cannot afford to let that sort of fire regime become the norm. The amount of damage, the cost to the Australian community it will far, far exceed the costs, for example, of a serious program of prescribed burning. The Americans have done a very good uh, economic analysis of this, and it's quite clear that uh, use of prescribed burning at the landscape scale is a much more economic proposition than the boom and bust approach of letting everything burn in megafires. Thanks, Mike. And Phil, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, uh, looking at the, the landscape studies that uh, that I've conducted, um, what I've seen is that consistently over that study period, um, it was the long unburned areas that were the least flammable. Now, this was something that uh, many people have recognised in the past. It, it came out of the uh, the Stretton Royal Commission in 1939 or 1940, following the 1939 fires, where the foresters at the time were concerned that the forests had been made flammable because people were burning them and promoting the growth of these dry shrubs. Um, that was their observation at the time, and uh, it was something I picked up from a lot of um, traditional land managers, graziers around the Snowies where I worked. Uh, so. I think if we're, if we're interested in controlling landscape fires, to me, the issue is about keeping those forests outside of that middle period of flammable regrowth. So we either have uh, very long unburnt areas that have naturally opened up, as we've seen they do, or we have areas of strips that we've broken up with very frequently burnt um, forests in there. So we can use those frequently burnt areas to perhaps protect areas of regrowth and try and encourage them into a, into a less flammable old growth stage. And we can also apply them along that fringe around assets that we're trying to protect where we've got evidence to show that they are helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've had a few questions come through uh, that look at Indigenous knowledge and look at place-based burning and, and understanding um, the values in a particular location. And, and there's, there's a, a question that's been quite liked looking at uh, how, how confident we are that we can translate Indigenous knowledge and combine that with, I, I guess, uh, European knowledge around those, looking at the way landscapes have changed and saying, how do we come up with uh, a set of knowledges, potentially, that look at protecting the values that we've talked about uh, in terms of people and, and agriculture and business, but also get species and ecosystems in place. And I guess I, I might go to, to Mike first and then to Tina. Thanks, John. I, I think we need to harness the best of Indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge in trying to understand how to um, manage landscapes. And I think one of the insights is the nuanced way in which they treated ecosystems. They didn't do broad scale burning on large scales, they burnt for very particular reasons, largely cultural to do with food and um, and ceremonial purposes, um, rarely to reduce risk. It was la largely nuanced. I think there's some wonderful studies in, New in uh, Western Australia 
by Susan Prober that are worth looking at, um, uh, a, a nuanced look. So um, I think we need to harness the best of both, but realise the scale of the challenge has changed and the landscape in which cultural burning is being perpetuated now has about 24, 24 million more people um, and uh, a whole bunch of infrastructure. So there's the, the landscape has changed in which we're doing that. So I think it's got to be much more nuanced and it's not the panacea that people are expecting. Thanks, Mike. Tina, would you like to comment on that? Absolutely. Um, well, the first point is, that, and we ha um, go back to what Oliver Costello was saying last uh, last week, is that the burning practices of Indigenous communities is based on been based on thousands of years of experience. And as Neil mentioned, we've got what sixty years of experience of prescribed burning. So that's the first indicator that we've got a long way to go. But maybe not just looking at traditional knowledge, but could we capture information from current Indigenous communities about what they see is changed? And I'm thinking here about um, changing in climates. What, what can we capture mm -hmm. from knowledge about the effects of droughts and how that um, might be changing, might have changed um, burning practices traditionally or what might be they suggest. So not just going back to what traditional practices were, but trying to understand their points of view and their uh, inputs of information about how we might look at the changing vegetation with droughts and uh, changes in precipitation and seasonality. Thanks, Tina. And that, that leads nicely into a question that Jason, Jason Sharples uh, put up that uh, people have been interested in. And really, it's looking at how, how things need to evolve. And I guess I'd, I'd uh, extend that question a little bit further than Jason's original intention, because we've got evolution in, un, in our understanding of fire behaviour. We've got climate change coming through. We've got a whole series of changes that are coming through. So I'd actually go through the panel one at a time, starting with Neil. And just quickly, Neil, what what are your thoughts on how do we adapt to, to this world that is really starting to change where history uh, gives us a guide but perhaps doesn't give us all the information that we'd like it to about what what to do to prevent uh, uncontrolled fire in the environment? Yeah, look, that's the challenge for us, isn't it? And certainly we can't just count history. We can learn a lot from it. Uh, and in terms of Aboriginal burning, Indigenous burning, uh, that's, that's quite variable and diverse across the country. Um, and as Mike pointed out, um, uh, they did it for different reasons and, and the, the world, uh, or the environment on this continent has changed a lot since traditional Aboriginal burning practices. But I think one of the way forwards uh, is to recognise uh, that we the world is changing, um, certainly in terms of the fire, bushfire space. Uh, there's no question uh, we are seeing, certainly in southern Australia, southern west, southwestern Australia, a drying climate. Uh, now, what are the ramifications of that for fuel dynamics, uh, what are the ramifications for that for um, uh, you know, the, the increase in fire danger rating um, and the length of the fire season and so on. There's been some studies around that we know, but fundamentally um, whether or not and for the extent to which our climate changes, uh, they are issues and questions that exceed the capacity of land and fire management agencies. They're issues that governments address and communities at large address. What we need to do and what we can do and what we must do is control or to manage rather the other um, important element of the fire triangle, which is the fuel loads and fuel structures. Uh, and until um, uh, we've got a solution to the, the changing climate, which I don't hold much hope for, frankly, I'm pessimist in that regard. I think that climate change, climate variability is going to push ahead. Um, we still need to manage uh, the fuel loads and fuel structures to mitigate the damaging impacts of bushfires on our society and our environment. Thanks, Neil. Mike, do you have a comment? Yeah, I think we need to focus on managing risk and looking at what this does, what this change with climate does to the distribution of risk and how we respond to it um, and learn lessons from this past summer and think, is more of the same the solution? is more of the same of what we're doing the solution or are we entering different space that requires different thinking and 
Um, my suspicion is that that's definitely the case. Thank you. Tina. Thanks. Uh, yes, um, we're going to need different thinking, different reactions, and I guess that the call to arms for, for researchers, for managers, for the community to be much more adaptive and you know put ourselves in the, the, the situation we're in now with uh, lockdown and COVID-19. We've all responded magnificently in our own different ways, um, looking at the future for for climate change and the effects it has on fire in the landscape should be the same way. We know we can do it, basically. Um, people being more open to uh, opinions, information, and m more um, understanding. Yep. All right, thanks. Phil, just quickly. Oh, you're on mute, Phil. Sorry, I think we actually have some opportunities. I've, I've been through and surveyed a number of areas uh, that were burnt during the, um, the recent fires in Eastern Australia. And there are areas that burnt that uh, have not had fire sometimes for millennia, um, sometimes for longer. And so we've got a changing situation there where areas are burning that haven't burnt in the past and yet as I look through those areas, I'm seeing fires that have burnt through at very low intensity through those those sites. We've been a little bit taken by surprise with areas not stopping fires that would have stopped them in the past, but I think we still have opportunities in understanding that uh, there are many areas in the landscape that still provide us with natural advantages. Even if they do burn, we may still be able to get in there and more aggressively use them to advantage to help defend the landscape rather than having to fall back to less effective techniques like back burning. Thank you. And Mark. And just make sure, make sure you take yourself off mute, Mark, please. Sorry, uh, is that better? Yep, thank you. Um, the challenges are many. Uh, in just published research in uh, the journal Nature Climate Change, uh, it's quite clear that the trees of the world on a global scale, the trees of the world have become more efficient in their use of water. They're closing their stomata and this is reducing near surface humidity. Now that is one of the major drivers of uh, in terms of fuel moisture, um, this is the sort of knowledge that we are going to have to bring into our thinking that the vegetation is responding to the change in climate and it's responding in ways that we can measure and that we can use that uh, as we go forward. The, but there are other areas and this falls into the category of the unknown unknowns <laughs> where we will see behaviour uh, in fires that we just have not been able to predict. And it's those are very challenging situations and certainly the firefighting community is having to face up to very difficult circumstances uh, as we go forward. But that just means as scientists, we've got to get hold of the new knowledge and bring it into our thinking around fires. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. And I think that that's a good way to, to get towards wrapping it up. And you know, the session today has been looking at prescribed burning. It is part of an integrated strategy which includes suppression, it includes land use planning, building regulations and other other things. Um, so to, to wrap up the session today, uh, I'm going to go past the panel again just quickly for you know 30 seconds. Is there a final closing statement or comment you'd like to make? And we'll go in reverse order, Mark. So uh, we'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, I think the diversity of views is important um, and not just the diversity of views of say a panel like this, but the diversity of views in the community. Um, again, recently published papers out of California say that unless we get the community attitude right, we have very little chance of implementing prescribed burning. Thank you. Phil. Yeah, I, I think it's it's good to understand that our forests um, survived for a long time before people came along. 
um, Aboriginal people managed them for a long time without helicopters and without our, our various tools. And I think it's reassuring to know that there are natural processes in there that can be made use of. And it's uh, my hope is that we're able to um, find those processes and work with them as much as we possibly can. Thanks, Phil. Tina. Um, I, I would go for a call to arms for creativity in how we uh, continue to look at prescribed burning, climate change, fire in the landscape, broaden our thinking a little bit more, perhaps. Thank you. Mike. Sorry, I think we need to acknowledge the shared responsibility that fuel management implies um, on both sides of the fence. I think if COVID has taught us anything is that we are all in this together and waiting for governments on their side of the fence to make us safe is delusional. Yeah, thank you. And Neil. Yeah, thank you. Look, there's not much more to add, I guess, given what the others have said, but I, I, I have a lot of confidence in science in helping us find ways through uh, the challenges ahead. But clearly, uh, the science must be applied. It must be. It must address the problems of land managers. Um, I, I get a little concerned when it diverts into into theoretical enterprise type science. So I, my plea would be: please, scientists, work closely with land managers, closely with the fire management agencies, to help us work our way through this. Thank you. Look, on that note, uh, given that our time is up, I'll pass back to Gary. Oh, thanks very much, John. Look, we could have continued with this discussion all day long. It was getting quite exciting. I would have liked a lot more discussion. Uh, history has shown that uh, Australia suffers many large fires and we've had many reviews. And so the open dialogue what we're having today is quite good in taking us forward. But what we really want to see is improved land management. So it's about getting the science to give us the answers for application by the land managers so that we don't suffer in the future large fires like we experienced over this last season. So thanks for the difficult job you did uh, managing it through there, John, and I'm sure there's many other questions which we need to be able to address and we'll endeavour to do that by following up with each speaker, asking them to answer the questions uh, that they didn't get time to address today. A recording of this uh, webinar will be available for you um, on the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC website and also on the CRC YouTube channel. Um, we will also email advice to all attendees and let them know of the webinar's availability. From the presentations provided and the answers to the questions, I expect that you have gained an appreciation of the areas of agreement from these researchers and the areas where we need further research and understanding of our forest fuels. Those of you who are operational personnel, I hope that you've gained an insight on what is possible to implement and also what further knowledge that you need researched to assist you to better manage forest fuels so you can reduce the frequency of the catastrophic fires which we experienced during the last fire season. Importantly, whether or not specific research studies are applicable across the landscape that you manage. You have to make that decision. Please email through your comments that you have about this webinar through to office at bnhcrc.com.au. So thank you to all presenters today, uh, to the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC personnel who did a marvellous job putting this on, and also to the Academy of Science. I hope to see many of you again through this webinar system again next Wednesday on the 20th of May at 11 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time and that will be for the practice of prescribed burning, the potentials and limitations with land management practitioners. So we will have operational personnel next year and for the nearly 400 people that are out there, I thank you for your attendance today also. Thank you.